Hello and welcome. Today I am joined all the way, I'm presuming it's all the way from the South Coast, from, but by Mehmet Jem, who is regional FCP lead and also hip specialist, also known as the hip physio. So Mehmet, really looking forward to talking with you today and uh, finding more out about you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, mate. It's always, it's, it's funny, obviously, what we were talking about just there. I always find like these kind of like titles and names and stuff make me feel awkward. And I even spoke to someone actually yesterday who'd been on a course who I didn't know and it just came up and I was like cringe a little bit. I'm still not kind of like used to, even like years of doing it, I still like kind of find it a bit awkward. But yeah, no, thanks for inviting me, mate. I'm always kind of, I never shut up as my wife tells me. So I'm looking forward to having another little bit of a chat with you and seeing what you have to say and you know, obviously watch your video. So looking forward to taking part, mate. So yeah, thanks for the, for the invite. And it, that, 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 I am down south now, so I'm in the south coast. So I'm pretty, pretty much like kind of west country. I wouldn't say I've like converted yet from like being city to like, west country ish just yet but yeah i'm down in exeter oh good yeah we'll, we'll get around to why why you why you ended up there anyway so where are you from originally then so i'm but my kind of heritage and background is turkish cypriot so i've got um, a lot of family in cyprus which is kind of where we're from um but it's myself i've kind of born in barnet lived in, in and around barnet my whole life and kind of grew up um in london and the outskirts of london pretty much um and then kind of I've been with my wife now over 10 years and it's taken her probably about like nine of those to convince me eventually to move down to Devon, which is where she's from. So I was kind of always against it. I was always kind of, you know, like the fact that I used to have everything around me, friends were like in Essex, went to university there and things like that. Um, and then like life changes, you know, I had two, two, two kids and kind of started to realise I need probably help from in-laws and wanted a bit of a quieter life. And so life gradually just pulled me down to, to Devon really yeah but my whole kind of essentially like life and career and everything like that pretty much started in and around London and outskirts Hertfordshire and, and Essex pretty much so I've kind of been I say I've been around like I've been around like this small vicinity of like London to the south I've don't, I'm not really ventured too far up north I'm not sure I'm not sure if I'd um, manage it so that people are a lot nicer up north aren't they compared to London we, we, yeah, we are we are <laughs> we definitely are so in terms of that then, so what is it like down there? Because I mean, I've been a couple of times and I've done quite a lot of stuff in Bournemouth previously, but I don't really know that Southwest. I definitely, it's on my list of things to do. But do you mean like kind of living wise or? Just living know? wise, really, yeah. Oh, it's, mate, it's so nice. It's so, so nice. I think one of the things I'd noticed, I think, having moved down is, I mean, we joke there about like kind of people up north being nicer. They are also a lot nicer down south as well in comparison to like what I'd been used to growing up, you know. I guess like commonly when you're in London and you kind of walk past people you don't really say hello like you don't really talk to a stranger or anything like that and especially if they saw me talking to them saying hello they'd probably think what's this random ball bloke like talking to me they probably thought I was gonna like mug them or something so it's quite refreshing now down in Devon everyone's like really approachable really kind of it's not I guess one of the things that always people used to say to me is like how are you going to adapt to having a slower pace of life and it's not been that much different like it's not yeah I guess there are some situations from a depending on where you work and environments it isn't going to be like London and Hertfordshire and Essex and those kind of things but it hasn't been that extreme I guess the benefit of where I am now I'm only like 10 minutes out of Exeter city centre which is like it's still a city still a fairly big city so um I'm still kind of like within that kind of area so I don't really know it's a big dramatic change but from a lifestyle perspective like this is now I mean I've been a physio for like we're gonna have oh, forever but like it's now I feel like I've it's weird I'm, I'm doing more but I feel like I've got the most work-life balance does that make sense like everything is just at a nice point now where I can kind of do things whereas before it was kind of like really intense long hours long days I was kind of used to that that was the norm and I was like kind of just thought that that was regular now being down south there's just a lot more to do a lot more outdoorsy stuff and um, yeah no it's been great it's definitely if you've been to Bournemouth mate you need to come down further to the west this is where it's happening down in the southwest is where not too far down west southwest so not much happens down right at the very southwest although I'll probably get pelters from all the Cornish people that now said that well, I've realized that I've realized something as well it's like this I didn't realize that like, how savage this like Devon Cornwall like beef is but yeah it's a um it's a real thing apparently but yeah anyway in answer to your question which i think you just said where are you from and i've somehow managed to kind of <laughs> try, try, <laughs> make it into that whole little monologue that that's hopefully answered your question 
No, it has. No, I'll definitely, I definitely will pay. I'll pay you a visit, and you can uh, show me the sites of Exeter anyway. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so growing up then, so what was it that made you first think about getting into into that the clinical world? That's a good question, actually. So like, I've done a, um, I mean, to be fair, I had start, I'd done a sports science degree to start with. I think the first, I, I was kind of aware of physio beforehand. My, my cousin, who's now like, you know, in her 20s, um, when, when I was a lot younger, well, she had cerebral palsy for like kind of not too severe, but like, you know, enough that she needed intervention and input in physio. Um, and I just remember like seeing it. I think I must have been like eight, nine, ten. And I remember like going to physio sessions with her, but it was like, this, this was in Cyprus mind as well. So fairly like all I can remember is like a Swiss ball in a physio gym, you know, with like the parallel bars, like basically like generic as standard physio setup as you can imagine. I just remember that in my head. And I remember like saying, trying to figure out like what it was that was going on. Cause obviously at that age, if you're not really that too exposed to it, you don't really understand like the kind of, rehab a physio would do and as I was growing up then I was like oh look you know there's a physio from what we're seeing there in this kind of clinic hospital obviously I love football I love all sports anyway any any sport really um and then I was obviously seeing it from a sport perspective as I was growing older and I was like oh there's the physio there as well and then I remember this other situation where my think my mum had like some like acute like pancreatic like issue or something I was still young I was must have been like before I was a teen but I had gone to hospital with her for it and then I remember that there was like a physio in the hospital and I was like hang on a minute there's all these bloody physio like physios are all over the place and you know when you're like before you're even 13 to start being a bit perceptive of like people because it interested me I think that's the other thing it interested me so I was just when I started to see those kind of jobs scattered around I was like oh it's not just you know Joe vlogs on a football pitch running on with a bit of spray and like an, a, and a wet sponge is actually there's more to it um but then I realized as I was growing up that I was quite into like I love science I love biology I love science all that stuff but I wasn't academic mate. like I'm not you know like some people were just a, like mad for like a stars a's I just wasn't like that I'm just like at, probably up until the point of where I did my physio masters I was just like I just did it I just did it I wasn't like kind of in the, in my books or whatever I just like knew what I had to do and and sometimes I would do enough to get to that point and other times it wouldn't work out I'll, I'll kind of bore you with my life story in a little bit but um that's why I thought well, like, I want to do something like that and that kind of led me to sports science but then the thing is when I was doing sports science and I realized I don't really want to be a sports scientist I quite like anything that I enjoyed in that was around like like injury prevention the sports therapy stuff was kind of merged into it a little bit I was kind of grown up a little bit by that point. I thought, like, what am I going to do? And I thought, like, I realised there's not much in sports science. But then I thought, well, actually, I'm quite keen to do physio. Um, so then that kind of, yeah, that drove me towards that, really. I mean, I've kind of tried to summarise about, like, 30 years into about three minutes. It's probably, I've done a, I've done all right with that, I think, actually. I think so, yeah, not too bad. I might, <laughs> I'll, I'll unpick it a little bit. So in, in terms of that sports science sense, the sports science in itself is a massive area. Yeah. And what was there any particular avenue? Like when I was picking my course, I liked sport and I wanted to go to university. And that was genuinely the extent of, of my thought process of it. Very immature attitude, but it's been good from my perspective. But what was yours in terms of that? Did you have a specific area that you did think was going to be good? No. So like this is a key example of like my academic life up until the point of us because the thing is when I started becoming a physio then I took shit seriously and then I was like actually I'm quite good at this and I, it wasn't as hard to study whereas I when I was doing my A levels I was like oh I was at, even then I was like I quite like to do physio and I applied to do physio but I didn't get into any physio courses because all the ones I want that I had to get into I think they were like it was like ABB or BBB or whatever and and I was off the mark not a million miles away but I was off the mark and at that point there was you know, going back like 13 years or so, there was real high demand for courses and jobs and places and all that kind of stuff. So I, I remember I got my A-level results when I was on holiday in Cyprus and I was like, oh, shit. I mean, I just want to go to uni. I didn't get into any of the physio modules courses. I thought I just wanted to go to uni. So actually I got onto the sports science degree as a result of clearing because I wanted to do something. And I thought actually that would lend itself a little bit to what I enjoy, which is like science and sport and that kind of stuff. Um, and I just didn't really like really to, to put too much onus on it. However, having said that, 
anyone I talk to now who is an undergrad who is in a similar boat where they're like not really sure how to navigate it or like how did you do it did you find it was beneficial or not like if I had the chance now I would do it exactly the same like I wouldn't change anything at all from from an educational perspective and inexperience because the thing is by the time I got to being a physio I was older I had an undergrad under my belt I kind of knew a lot more I was a bit more like kind of socially progressed in the sense that you know I wasn't like as lazy or as cocky or whatever you just kind of have more mileage talking to people different people as you're growing up that's just a part of life and I think that's paramount to the strength as a physio whatever kind of role that you're in um so yeah I kind of would think if I had to do it again I would do it exactly the same but it's interesting how it got me to that point because I kind of knew I wanted to do something but it wasn't as straightforward as I do my A-levels I go to uni I get into uni I do my degree I just had to kind of muddle my way round to that point and um my the bigger big influence in my life is my my granddad he's, he's passed away now but he was like a complete science like genius he, he was a hematology specialist a dna specialist pharmacist like open like pioneering clinics in cyprus like really highly regarded um in, in his field and he was always oh why don't you do medicine he was always saying that to me he wouldn't give a shit if i don't know an undergrad he'd be like why aren't you doing medicine or I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm, d- I'm done my master's. I'm going to do my master's. He's like, why don't you do medicine? And I'm like, I just really don't have, I didn't have, I knew I didn't have like the patience at all to go and put in the graft what is needed. Because I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't like academically like the top. And you kind of need to be a bit like, I just would, I just didn't have that. And I thought actually, because I know I'd be good at the physio stuff with probably not as much of that intense, like studying and putting your head into the book because I used to just like doing stuff I used to like play football going out doing I would never have been able to have sacrificed that if I went to uni and did that like I would have been shit like so I was like you know for me it worked out well and even now um I think yeah I just I just don't think I would change it I love being a physio and I love like the kind of opportunities that physio brings in different you know jobs and, and things like that so then, so when you, you graduated doing your, your undergrad for sports science, did you have a clear plan of, yes, I do want to go on and do that then? Then was that, was that something you'd been thinking about for a while? Yeah, I'd say probably end of year one. I guess I was naive though. I did the sports science degree and I was like, oh, I can just switch to physio. Well, you know, when you're 18, you just think these things are realistic. But like in reality, it doesn't work like that. So I got to the end of the year one and I love sports science degree, to be honest. It was great. It's kind of taught me quite a lot. But I got to the end of the year one and I was like, look, I want to do physio. But then I thought I cannot be asked to do three years after I've just done these three years by the end of it. So I was kind of looking online and found that at Essex, which wasn't too far from where I was living, was about like a two year condensed master's, like the pre-reg course. So actually, I started putting a lot of effort into that understanding what I needed to do to get into that and I finished my undergrad I think it was whatever when is it like June May June and I actually started the masters like a few months after so I just made it because I wanted to start like immediately I didn't want to go and work or do a year's work just none of that stuff interested me like I'm really like when I know what I want I'm like very very driven and motivated to do it just up until that point I wasn't really too sure like at what level I was kind of keen to do it but when I knew I wanted to do it I was like I want to do it now so I was just like what's the quickest way I can get to that point to start and then go from there and that was the kind of light bulb moment for me really and yeah I haven't really looked back since really mate it feels like it went that long ago but it was so long ago I had I had bloody hair mate when I was doing my undergrad could you imagine I used to straighten my hair I used to straighten my hair at university I'm not even joking Maybe that was, that was a problem. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Look, looking back in hindsight, probably so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look back at some of my haircuts from uni, and it's like, yeah, I should have used more product on it. Look, absolutely <laughs> hideous. It doesn't matter. It's all hidden away on Facebook somewhere. That's true. Yeah. Um. So then, so how to get onto that master's course? Then was that easy for you to do? Was the, do your degree enable you to to get on, or was that a struggle? No, it was it was pretty straightforward, and I think that's probably what helped me because I thought, oh, look, I don't need to like I had to get you know decent ish degree, and I had to get through that, but I didn't have to worry about like the I knew I didn't have to be at like the very very top, but I knew I just had to kind of get a you know show a certain level and get onto it. Um, but the biggest challenge was obviously going in for the interview because it was fairly intense interview getting onto a masters for physio. It was a lot of um, like group work and communication but like that's what I'm that's my strength like I can kind of like talk and communicate and by that point I was like actually if I if that's what I have to do 
almost like above the academic side because the academic side i know if i can finish the degree it's enough if i can do the degree and like not completely flop it then that's going to be my in so then when i was doing like the interviews and all that stuff i thought actually that's when i could sell myself and i kind of knew that would have been my strength so so that wasn't too too bad at that point so i kind of knew what i had to do whereas like doing the undergrad and getting like a levels are tough mate i'll tell you what now like having done like masters post-grad diplomas and all that stuff like my a-levels were the hardest thing i've done like academically it's just so intense like so much so when i talk to like patients or whatever they're like 16 17 18 i just really remember like how intense it is it's a lot of work and it's a lot of stress for a young person to go through but yeah no, i remember it i remember it well yeah it's a massive step up from gcse isn't it it's like it's mm. a real shock to the system yeah definitely definitely but you know i guess it's not you know, some people benefit from that. Some people don't mind. Others, you know, don't kind of even take that avenue and then go on and be multi-millionaire. So, you know, works well. Yeah. So then, so when you were doing the course, then did you have a clear idea? You mentioned a few different areas that you looked at, whether it was sport or other areas. But do you did you have a plan in mind for what you wanted to do post with the, with, the, with, with post physio after physio? Yeah. 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 I did. I know. I, I kind of. I kind of went into that knowing MSK was what I wanted to do. I remember like, so in preparation for getting onto that, a lot of it was like trying to demonstrate your awareness of physio. And that's when I knew like, actually, I know this already. Cause remember I said, told you like when I was younger and I was kind of exposed to that stuff when I'm kind of in, I remember it vividly, mate. I don't remember. I my wife has a go at me cause I don't remember to can take the bins out from like two days ago, but I remember stuff from like this. And when I was going through, the, the process of recruiting into that interview, I thought actually, like it's really easy for me to do this because I'm just pulling on personal experiences to demonstrate that awareness rather than having to look for a book and think, well, actually like they do this and they do that. So that come, came quite easy to me. But because of that, I knew that like, I don't want to be a respiratory physio, like no disrespect to like any spiritual physios or neurophysios listening, but you know, I knew what I wanted to do, which was MSK. And at that point, like I didn't really, mind how I did it because I knew like I'd, I had to do it like off my own back like you know it's like at that time it was hard getting jobs mate like really really hard I remember going for like band five interviews and it was just like you had to say the right thing at the right time for them to tick the box even to like get to any point of progression and um yeah I was at a point at that stage where I was like look I'll take but like, I know I can be in any environment and make myself I mean, I sound like, a, like a prick but like you know I, I know what I can do I'm fairly self-driven so the first job that I'd done in Essex post-grad afterwards, I was like, look, I, I want to be an MSK physio. So I was looking for what was available, ended up getting a job for um, IPRS, which is like a kind of, you, yeah, I think you worked, did you work for IPRS? Or I worked for IPRS, like, yeah. You were, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got a job for, with IPRS in Dunton at their full like technical centre. And I was just one physio on my own in a team of like a, a doctor and occupational health nurse. There's no other physios. So really now, in hindsight, probably... The worst environment to start your physio career like on your own but like i kind of backed myself because i was like i know i don't know anything i don't know even now, now remember like some of the stuff that i used to do and it make, make me cringe but came out of uni i thought actually i know that i don't know enough but i'm not one of these people to just sit back i kind of like spent a lot of time doing research reading up doing a lot of stuff outside of work trying to kind of figure out what i can do post-grad again education wise just to kind of help that and i say that to people now when i talk to them I'm like look you can do what you want if you're self-directed and you know what you need to do to bet yourself and progress career-wise then you don't always need to be in a band five rotation with a big team but other people need that other people kind of need that little bit of guidance and support whereas i kind of knew maybe because I, by that point obviously i was like like 23 24 i kind of knew a little bit more that look if i want to progress i need to not be as crap a physio so i kind of knew what i had to do mm. so how long were you at iprs for then uh two years there was a point in my career probably in the first like let's say six years seven years where i was only in a job for like one and a half or two years not by right. chance but just because i always wanted to just do something else and i thought every time an opportunity came up like i never wanted to put an opportunity like if something comes up i'll say yes i'll commit to it and then I'll I'll deal with like how I'm gonna achieve that like successfully afterwards. And sometimes opportunities will come up and I'll be like, I'm probably gonna be at my depth, but I'll make it by the time I do it that I can kind of 
manage it. I just kind of, my personality with this kind of stuff is a bit like that. And um, it's kind of worked in my favour, I guess, a little bit. But also, yeah, just got to kind of like be cautious with some stuff as well, really. But yeah, by that point, I was there for two years. I loved it, mate. I loved it. It was such a great learning experience for me, working with like different like clinicians and different people and um, actually quite a lot of responsibility for like a new grad physio to be able to kind of like a lot of people asking you questions about like put on sick leave and ability to get back to work and you know they're kind of putting a lot of onus on your like kind of expertise and judgment so um, I quite like that though I quite like responsibility and stuff and, and bits like that I mean I say that now probably in hindsight looking back on it at the time I was probably kind of treading it but I do remember it positively it was good are you there now then are you still working with IQRS or you no no so I was there for five and a half years but then I set physical okay. up nearly 11 years ago now so I was oh, there yeah. was I there like 06 to like 2012 but oh, I was... so you're like you're like my good friend Charlie Chaz Charlie good child yeah well yeah yeah, yeah. So, so I was on the on the equipment side of things, but um, yeah. yeah, I used to link in. We used to link in. We go to like Dagenham yeah. Geek Trag up in Liverpool. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, I, I was amazing. It changed my life really working at IPRS. Yeah. Like it was amazing that like, we did. We actually did some trips to the Middle East. Um, oh, wow. you, you, when, when did you finish there then? Um, God, it must have been like I think it's probably. Well, it must have been like around. 2007 ish maybe okay yeah so we probably ju- may may have just just missed each other um but like dave bingham was he, was he... oh that rings a bell that rings a bell mark hole like mark, mark i worked with mark actually enough of it after that so yeah it's funny because i met a couple of people and then it's like you fight say the names i then pop up like in different circles but in the physio world actually but no it was good it was actually you know it was really really kind of de- de- decent role actually but fairly different to the norm and I guess that might have been partially why I moved actually I think because I was quite keen just to kind of have a little bit more of a um, varied like working environment yeah and what were the next roles then if you were jumping from job to job what, what came next so the one so, so after that actually I got um, approached by a um, it was like a I can't remember the, the name of the company but it was kind of based it was a private physio company but based within like a David Lloyd so it was almost like another self-directed um, clinical role where you kind of like manage like self you know you build the clinic as much as you want almost like a sort of self self driven one and um again at the time i was like oh i don't know if i really like the idea of like taking the plunge from being like in this like employed role into like trying to like generate stuff myself and but i thought actually yeah again i just thought yeah i'll do it i'll commit to it i'll see how it goes because i thought actually it'd be quite nice to start doing some of the stuff where i was doing like the sports and the rehab and the environment was different because obviously i was working in that occupational health setting and it wasn't really too conducive to be doing like squats and lunges when I had like chinos and a polo top on or whatever you know and smart shoes so it wasn't like in that kind of environment and I wanted to do that like as a young physio I was like I want to do exercises I want to do stretches I want to do that stuff so to be able to be in like a David Lloyd environment at that time I was like actually you know that's perfect for me that's ideal and um when I was coming out of uni I um <laughs> I just felt like, I guess it's funny how you remember stuff when you start talking about it, but I had um, started working with a football club called AFC Sudbury, which is like between Suffolk and Essex. And um, yeah, I'm laughing now because I remember doing that. And I remember doing that, realising I was literally, I'm sat at my desk. I literally don't know what I'm doing, but I wanted to just expose myself and learn from that. So when I went to David Lloyd, I was still doing that. And I was still doing that a couple of nights a week in games. And I was trying to kind of, just get mileage um, wherever I could. And there was a point where I would do that. I would be doing the football. I would be at West Suffolk, um, like sports academy and doing some stuff there. And it was always like awful money, mate. You know, sometimes with physio, I think back then it was just like, I mean, even now with some stuff, it's like so underpaid. But I remember I used to get like 40 quid here or 40 quid there. Like it wasn't for the money. Like, you know, I just wanted to, in my head, I was like, I want my CV to be like, better than someone else's because I knew there was going to time there's going to be a time where like an opportunity is going to arise and I don't want it to be the fact that I always just got three years of experience always just got three and a half or whatever I just wanted to, to show that I had some different variety to that so I had done that actually and that was great I was there for um again I think it was like another two and a half three years and then I was like look I really wanted to do more post-grad stuff I was like I need to I want to do like like a, a master's or, or something I just had the like kind of desire to learn really and then after that I kind of um 
join Nuffield, and that was a kind of the big kind of chunk of work that I've done after that. And what was Nuffield like then? Because it's, it's an unusual setup. It's a charity, isn't it, Nuffield? Yeah, they, they were great. I can't, I, to be honest, I can't speak highly enough, but they were really supportive. I think by that point, I had been with them for, <clears throat> God, it must have been like seven or eight years or something before I left to join Pure. Um, but like a key example of like what worked well at Nuffield for me was that I had, well, when I left, I had done four jobs. I had done like a senior physio role. Um, I worked into like an advanced practitioner post, physio manager, and, and also like a clinical lead of, at a hospital. So there was like those opportunities were great for me. But again, like a bit of an example, I was in each one for like two and a bit years just because I always wanted to like just progress. And I don't get like that. That's not me being... I don't want it to come across that I'm like fickle and just like get bored or anything like that. I just like a bit of development. I'm far more settled now, mind. I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely like much more like kind of like chilled into what I'm doing at the moment. But at that time, I just wanted to kind of push on. And that was great. And then they supported me to start looking into like post-grad stuff and master's work. And, um, and that's when I started to put a lot more time into my, my hip stuff as well, actually, kind of in that kind of, eight, seven, eight year bracket, that's when I was starting to put a lot more focus on trying to develop things in and around that pretty much. So you mentioned the hip then, so how, what was that an active thing that you could see that there wasn't much going on in that area or was it that you were genuinely interested? I mean, look, mate, Andy, I could probably sound really like bright and like I put some sort of like strategy together to be like, it, it, it's not, it weren't the case. Basically I had, um, when I was coming out of uni, out of my masters, I had um, I was playing football at the time. I was I'm not aware, I was never good at football. I was no, but in my head I was fantastic. But like in reality, I was like average Sunday league footballer. But um, I had injured my hip. But I always just thought like oh, it's just groin tear, groin strain, or whatever. Um, as you did when you're like 80, 90, you just carried on playing with it. And it got to a point, and I remember it like I was. Well, I think I was like 20 at the time. I was playing a football match, kicked off, turned to sprint, uh, then I had to come off. I was like, I can't actually run and sprint. It's just like something happened and I just couldn't play. So it's probably like the fastest substitution in like Sunday league history that, that, that down in North London. But it was um, the catalyst for me kind of getting it looked into. And basically I had FAI syndrome that obviously at the time I had no clue what the hell that was, but um, had a, uh, like in a really quick like summary, basically had surgery, didn't go too well. I had like a two year window of where it was just like really bad like I was like limping a lot I didn't run literally did not run for two years because it was like so painful it just wasn't a great experience at all um and because I was coming out of uni like I had no idea like, like I had no idea what any of it was like if you said to me hip labrum like I wouldn't even know what where that was like I just you know just don't really know these things as, as in depth so I wanted to know like if I was like going for a scan or they said anything I was like I want to know what that is so I started reading a lot around it um and then I just realised that as the years went on, that like I started to gain quite a lot of knowledge around the hip and the pelvis because I just kept looking into it or reading or researching. Or if I did anything like postgraduate wise, I would always bias it towards a hip condition or a hip treatment or an exercise plan. It was always like hip centric. Not because I wanted to help myself. I just was like, it just... It just it was a subconscious thing. I just, it was interested. I never really thought about it at all. And... Um, as the years went on, I just now and again was asked to do like a talk or a seminar or something like that. And um, then I just realised that actually, you know, like I'm starting to get quite a lot of knowledge around something. And equally, I quite like talking about it. And I don't mind being in a forum where I can kind of like talk to people. Like it doesn't, it doesn't bother me too much at all. Like, and I thought actually those two things kind of lend themselves quite quite nicely and then it just kind of transpired from there really mate like I never like sat there when I was like eight thinking oh god I can't wait to be a specialist <laughs> it's pretty pretty dra pretty dreary dream if you had that as your kind of life ambition really but I love it now I'm so passionate like if anyone kind of talks to me about hips I just can't shut up like I really love it and I really enjoy kind of like seeing and talking to people about it. a lot of the patients I see now privately have like really long-term complex issues and it's really but I, I, I do it like because I love to help people where they've been in a situation where they've just not been able to find the right person to talk to. And a lot of the time I don't do anything exciting. It's just applying like the right knowledge to the right thing. And I'm lucky in the sense that I specialise in an area where it's not that common to specialise in in comparison to other places. So it's just it's helped me kind of build like a bit of a, a base with 
guess stuff I'm doing outside of work. I'm not giving you a chance to talk, Andy. Sorry, mate. It's not about me. It's not about me. No, no, it's good. It's definitely good if I'm not talking. So then in terms of like that, you mentioned outside of the work stuff, like you, you quite there's a big social media presence. And how did that happen? So I, I've i actually got Charlie and Andy, my mate Andy, to thank for that. So during lockdown, so this is like kind of 20, 2022, we had like we were three really close friends and um we just uh, Chaz and andy had charlie and andy had this discussion around wanted wanting to set up like a, a podcast and like a, a health and well-being kind of educational platform uh called called the health space which um they kind of currently rebranded into something else and they, they've done really well with that but at the time um, i was still working at nuffield so it was a case of like i guess it was it was difficult for me to continue doing it because i couldn't apply as much time um, as they wanted to and i didn't want to hold them back because it was their idea it was like their little baby but at the time andy was like oh you know what you should like open your own instagram account so then we can kind of like share the main platform to more people because at the time my instagram was just my personal and instagram it was like my, my dinner from like three weeks ago and a picture of my dog or my, my trainers or some rubbish like that i never really used it so i started I opened a professional account. I thought, like, I was like, what the, hell, what the hell am I going to talk about? And then I realized actually there's only one thing I can talk about because it's the only thing that I know very well. And it was just hip stuff. And by that point, I started, I had a lot of content in regards to like the course I put together, the course that I had done partly for Nuffield as well, the talks and seminars that I've done. So it was easy. I was just like getting stuff out there. And then I quite like, uh, it's always intrigued me like the psychology around like just like people's behavior and when I started looking into it and I was doing it I was like again like I don't want to do this like half-hearted I didn't want it to be uh, just like a shit account I thought I want this to be like really good and I started diving into like like marketing on social media and the psychology around social media and I just had this thought in my head I was like look, I want to kind of make people stop and read it like and a lot of the time when you're reading stuff on social media and like marketing and psychology a lot of it is like trying to grab someone's attention instantly and stopping them from scrolling past it and like compelling them to watch or read or do whatever but equally I wanted to do that but then I didn't want to just talk shit like I wanted them to read it and thought oh actually I've learned something as well so I spent some time just trying to think about how can I do all of those things how can I make it look nice and visually appealing how can I make it compelling, but also like what value can I offer? And a lot of that came down to me creating content for patients and for clinicians. And because of that, I think that's why it's grown because I've, I've tried to cast my audience for everyone pretty much rather than trying to be, because it can be quite specific, you know, a one joint specialist on a social media platform isn't the most sexiest thing in the world, but I just wanted it to be useful. And I thought like, the only way I can kind of make it grow is by not like, um avoiding anyone like so my audience is like the world basically it's just whoever's got whoever, whoever wants to learn or a lot of the time whoever's got a hip issue really and it's just i don't know how i don't know why but it's just you know the popularity is, is gone and then as it grew i just thought this is a good opportunity for me to like just meet and help other people as well so a lot of the stuff that i do online now is great and it's mainly through people were finding me through that or friends of a family or friends of a friend or whatever. And then I've got like online consults from people from all over really. And it's great because they might not be near someone, you know, we're lucky that NHS and stuff, we're near a lot of different specialists. Sometimes you're not like in a country that has availability to that, or even in a part of England that might not have availability to that. So yeah, it's been good. Then, so uh, how onerous is it on your time then to manage it? I've limited it now. Look, purely because I've, I've got two two young kids and I've got a like exceptionally supportive wife as well but like I value my time out of work now like really quite quite highly so I try to limit it purely because I've done the graft like I used to do like four days of clinic I used to then do the private clinic in the afternoon the evening I used to finish at like 9 nine thirty Saturday mornings and so now because I don't I've kind of been managing it myself i'll like obviously i work for pure physio full-time that's like my, my my primary job but then if i finish at four then i can do like one or two hours of my private online consults and then i try to limit that now to like a handful a week or even like maybe like two or three a week depending on like how many kind of follow-ups and stuff that i've got 
purely so I can put that focus in to those patients. And a lot of the time it's not the kind of patients where you've got to kind of see them every week anyway. So I've always got like the opportunity to put, uh, yeah, normally it kind of uh, books up quite quickly. But um, yeah, because of that, and because it's my own management of it, it doesn't mean that my days are like too blocked out at all. And I, you know, I'll take the girls and pick them up from school three days a week. Um, pure like, you know, the last year of working for Pure has been the one of the best highlights of my career so far. It's been the most enjoyable year of work that I've done since joining them. And a lot of it comes down to the, I guess I could say we now have been there for a year, but it's kind of like the, our belief around trying to have like a good work-life balance and, and valuing that for whoever's joining and doing those kind of things. So, um, yeah, that's why I mentioned you before. It's like the busiest I've ever been, but equally like the most balance I've ever had, which is which is great. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I'll come back to the question about social media because like you mentioned Pure and like everyone who I speak to, everything I see is just like, this is an amazing company to work for. And like even just chatting to Finn, you can see it coming through from him of how, how much he loves it and how much he saw. Sort of, to me, it's all sort of like, I can't believe how good this is. Basically, that's the impression that I got from it. But w- what is it about that? Then you mentioned about like the work life balance piece. But what 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 else is that makes it like that to work? Yeah. There's at the moment we've got probably like 200 physios scattered across the country doing other clinic work, FCP work, or whatever. And there is just a very strong like support network. Whether it's the people that are working in a group together, whether it's people that are working remotely or whatever. And I tell you what, like a lot of it is a credit to Finn. And he is the first person to kind of shoot himself down and, you know, calls himself like crazy. Well, he's a little bit crazy and everything, but, you know, he's, um, I think having a director and an owner of a company and having like an ops director like Tom, who are really like the people, you know, part of a big, you know, group of individuals who help it work, but are essentially a big part of that, who are still clinicians and working in clinic has a big impact on like, and also their approachability. You know, Finn, his po- a- anyone I talk to on LinkedIn who approaches me for like work or whatever or interview has spoken to Finn. Anyone who's anyone, oh, I've spoken to Finn. Sometimes they say Phil or whatever, but like to have someone that approachable and personable, like it filters down from a company leader, it, cu- it filters down. And like, I know that most, or if not all people who kind of, oh, I can't talk for others anyway, but I personally, anyway, when I joined, I thought it was great to see, like, how connected everyone is and to have an organisation who clinically, by the way, is, like, outstanding. Like, our level of kind of expertise is, like, I've never worked with clinicians who are this good. Like, they, every day, like, there are people that are in my team or other teams that really inspire me to, like, learn more about other aspects of, of physio. Um, but a lot of that comes down to, like, how that company is, been created and developed and how it's kind of been pushed forward with its quality and a lot of that is down to, to Finn and the team that he's had really since the beginning um, and we kind of really focus on those pillars either by supporting the clinicians that we have or when recruiting in so that everyone feels that they're supported and one of the things that we use really well is like Microsoft Teams can be used like really awfully but when you've got 200 physios and FCPs that might be working in a clinic on their own the way that the support network that we've got is that like if you look you know you could say someone messages at 12 o'clock saying is anyone free for a quick chat someone will message them by 1201 and would be calling them and they might not know them but that's the kind of um that's the kind of like traits and characteristics and trends that we've kind of instilled in everyone so that everyone feels supported um but yeah and partly because of that it's, it just has worked really well and when you've got people who are happy at work mate they tend to do better and if you've got a happy physio who's doing well and feeling supported and content, then they work better. And then that's when word of mouth spreads to the other organizations and other like PCNs or kind of GP clinics, et cetera. Cause they're like, actually, you know what? Like Alex is doing really well. Like we had a physio with Alex, Alex Thomas in Plymouth is such a great physio, superb FCP. They're all great. But uh, this particular story, Alex went to an event, met a GP, and off the back of that, that GP clinic is then like, actually, we're quite keen to get involved as well because they heard of how good he's doing. And that is a really common trend throughout the country and why our growth has been so quick. And a lot of that is down to just like the structure of like how we function really from, from the core. And a lot of that comes down to the, the team and the members that we've got. 
Yeah, it really comes across very much so like that on social media, which is it's good. It's really good because you can hear so many other things that maybe a bad culture or mm. not just in the physio world, but in, in, in numerous companies. So it's great. No, it is really good. And how did you end up at Pure? Um, so I did this every quarter. We've got a CPD event, like a, a national CPD day. So doesn't matter if you're in a clinic, sports injury clinic, FCP, everyone doesn't work for that day. We pull everyone off their diary. We Everyone goes into their regional blocks, Northwest, Yorkshire, Southwest. We all get together face to face and have a day of CPD. And half of that day is an external speaker. And then I did that two years ago. I thought, oh, uh, yeah, two years ago now. I did that for them during lockdown remotely. I did the half a day CPD training for them. Um, off the back of knowing Matt Shutt, who I had done part of my master's with, um, who works with us as our CPD lead. And um, off the back of that, I was in, just talking to Matt and I was like, why is everything up north? Like, I know up north is great, but like, why is it always like Midlands and Manchester? Like, why is there nothing down south? Purely out of intrigue. I was just like, what, why, like, why was that? And um, it just was coincidental that they got a contract like down the road from where I live like that week when I was asking that. And then I spoke to Finn and Finn is like as infectious as they get really fairly irrepressible. And he can kind of convince me a lot of opportunities and stuff like that. And um, much like I said to you before, like, you know, I said to him, I never worked in primary care. Didn't even know what a PCM was or FCP. Like I literally, I was asking him in the interview these questions, which most of the time they probably would turn around and say like, why are, we, why are we even talking to this person? But um, if I was fully committed, I was like, yeah, I'll go for it. Like, as I know that I'll, much like from the other times, I'll just kind of try and adapt and learn. And um, it's been great. Honestly, it's been so, so much fun. And I, yeah, I love it now. It's been really good. Mm, yeah. And what do you envisage as being the future for you then? I, I'm quite settled here now. <laughs> I'm quite settled here. It's like the first time where... I don't really have that like dramatic urge to go and like do, I just want to kind of keep building on my hip stuff, keep, keep I really, we've got so many opportunities um, in the Southwest region for, for Pure that I'm just like really, really excited for, for the years to come to keep trying to develop that and build that um, and also try and develop some of the physios that we've got within the team and helping them kind of achieve and do other things as well. So yeah, it's a lot of, out of the two things I'm doing, loads of exciting things are going on. So, yeah, lots to come pretty much. Yeah, no, sounds like it. And what I was going to ask previously was, you must have had some good heckles on Instagram. But as in, like, kind of troll-type people. Actually, you that know was, what? Yeah. <clears throat> I could probably, luckily for me, I could probably count them on one hand. Like, in the past, like, it's been like, I've been doing it for, um, for yeah, like, yeah, two, two, two years now. And luckily, it's not too often. Uh, and I try and purposely do that because I don't like you know like when you're on your phone a lot like I'm on my phone a lot for work I'm on my phone a lot for like social media and stuff like that and my laptop I don't want to look at my phone and see negative stuff like I don't want to look at my phone and like have my brain clouded with like negative comments or and you get the odd one now and again and but luckily it's never too I kind of learned from tr interacting with it I kind of like leave that. I leave that to Adam Adam Eaton is great at that like he's got far thicker skin than I have you can kind of like get on with it and do it whereas I'm a little bit more like you know can get a little bit sensitive so I was like I don't really want to be reading stuff like that really I just want a like nice harmonious life and looking at all nice positive stuff so um but sometimes mate it happens and I've just learned actually now that my time is fairly valuable like you know I'd more rather be if I'm not with my family I'm working to support my family I don't want to be wasting my time like having an argument with someone on a social media comment who is not even worth my time so um I just block them. <laughs> I tend to just block and delete them, but they still find you. I had someone find me on this bloody platform on LinkedIn. I didn't even know that was possible, but they, they find you. Um, so I've just, I, I've learned now to try and kill with kindness and that never really kind of goes down well with someone that's being negative. So I don't really like rowing, mate, to be honest, not unless I'm watching football and it's Arsenal Tottenham and I've got a Tottenham fan in my ear, then I'll have a row, but I, I'm, I'm normally fairly chilled out. Yeah, you must be missing being in London then. Well, uh, Arsenal top of the league. Yes, I am. Yeah, I think I, th I think this is the time where I'd like to be there. But um, yeah, luckily I kind of get to get I follow them as much as I can do on, on TV and stuff like that. But yeah, they're doing very well, so I'm very happy with that. Making me a happy man. What's your predictions? Oh, top of the league, win the league. Who do you support? Everton. Oh, that's all right. Okay, so that's fine. I don't need to worry about you. But yeah, I reckon we'll win the league. <laughs> 
win the Europa League, maybe the FA Cup. Trevor, I'd say. Oh, good. Well, it's good to see you. <laughs> all, all the other stuff you've said before, completely. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm really honest. I'm really honest. <laughs> Well, it was no, interesting think... actually because it's like we, you got Arteta at the same time we got Ancelotti, and it was like it yeah. was sort of you could have thought they could have either gone either way, and like yeah. the the difference in I mean you know with Arsenal obviously been much more successful recently, but it's it's amazing what he's done. I know, yeah, <clears throat> and I was always a bit like I think I was I'm, I'm a really fairly realistic football fan. Like I don't look, no one likes to lose, but also I'm aware that managers need a little bit of time to like kind of embed, but. Um, I think he started quite well, so it bought him a little bit of time. And then after a while, I was like, look, you could see what you're trying to do. More often than not, to be honest, we had so many bad players that like, when they started to go, I was like, actually, like, they must know what they want to do. And it's the first time I've watched them now this year and back in the last year, actually, really. I was watching them thinking, this is like as exciting as it was when I was watching them like eight years ago. It's like now I'm watching them. Like, I'm not scared if we're losing. Whereas like, when we were losing before, I was like, this is going to be 5-0. We're going to get stuffed. Whereas now I'm like, oh, actually, we could do something, which is which is great. Like I'm really passionate. Like my wife hates me for watch, when she when I watch football, she just thinks I'm an idiot. But like I'm just really passionate about it. So it's great to kind of see them doing well. And um, yeah, I, I don't think we're going to win the league, but I definitely think we're going to be top three, mate. I don't really see us kind of like falling away. I feel like I don't really see who can beat us over there, Man City. But like I'll leave that in there because I just want to leave some nibbles for your whoever's listening to like give me. <laughs> this is when the pelters will start coming in. <laughs> It's, it's good to see Arsenal back up there because like my one of my favourite teams is that Petit Vieira. Yeah, just just amazing, weren't they? Obviously Henri, everyone talks about Henri, but yeah, some of the players then it was unbelievable. Yeah, it was my um, yeah. I'd say Henri is like one of my one of the top players that I kind of used to like look up to. Yeah, it was great watching him. I miss, I miss them days, mate. I do miss them days. It's honestly, I, I don't think it's as good. I don't think it's, uh, no. but again, maybe that's just an age thing, isn't it? That you're always know, thinking of your, your golden era of like that naughty <laughs> period. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, look, in our day. Older, but people always say that when they kind of go back to the 1970s and all that stuff. And you think, really, were they that good? But then in 20 or 30 years, we're going to be like, oh, honestly, Messi and Ronaldo were like, and people say that. And you think when you're like a bit younger, you're like, oh, really, were they? And then like, yeah. but at some point, that'll be us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. And then just outside of your clinical work, then what uh, what sort of stuff do you read? You seem like you're very much about culture <laughs> and that the clinical stuff is important, but it's the surrounding oh, mate, skill sets. I, I read, the, I, my, oh, God, mate, the books that I read are absolutely dog shit. You know, no one listening to this is going to want to take a recommendation for me reading a book. I'm, I'm inherently bad at finishing a book, but I also have the most narrow taste in books in the sense that I like real life like CSI type like case study type situations autobiographies um or anything military like SAS type like real I like kind of reading real life events or real life stuff um the last book that I read was Rog and Rog um Ross Edgley is it Ross Edgley he basically swam across the whole of the UK like open water swam across the whole of the UK non-stop like didn't come back on land until he well, not non-stop, as in he stopped. Like, obviously, he's not like bloody fish, but he just kind of, they had a, bat, a boat on sea, so he never went onto land until he finished. Um, what, around the UK? He swam oh. The whole UK. Yeah, 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 and the whole UK. And um, he's an ex-military marine SAS stuff. And, um, yeah, that was great. That was like, his book is on, like, resilience. It was just kind of, like, listening and reading about, like, how he, like, his mindset. I mean, it's it's impossible to take stuff away from books like that. I read that, and I'm like, you're making it sound easy than it is, mate. Like, it's saying about mindset and stuff like that. Sometimes I can't be asked to get off the couch when I've had a long day at work. But you're talking to me about your 360th mile was quite tough. And I was just like, but it was interesting read. But so, but yeah, I tend to kind of, I don't read to learn too much. Like, I don't really, I'll tell you what doesn't interest me too much. Per, just personally, is like a lot of people find quite a good value and learn a lot from like um, developmental books and like leadership books and stuff like that. And I just like my, like I just don't, it doesn't um, encompass my attention enough to like benefit from it. Like, so I've never really have got into it really. Like I've tried to, but um, I think it's cause like when I'm doing stuff that's not work, I quite like for it to not be too work related. That's why even when I'm talking to my wife about like my day, I'm like, I really want to talk about it, but also I've just literally been dealing with it like all, all day as well. So, you know, it's that kind of thing sometimes where you want to just do stuff that's a little bit more, um, 
Oh, I say relaxing, but then I go and read about people getting bloody murdered. So it's not really, is it? But, you know, it's just interesting, I guess. Yeah, no, you like what you like, don't you? So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, don't really appreciate your time on this. And uh, right, mate. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for the invite. I hope it's... Um, I always find it interesting when anyone ever listens to me anyway. So if any, whoever has listened to this, thank you. I hope it's not like wasted an hour of your life too much. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for listening. No problem. And I'm looking forward to seeing the sights in Exeter at some point. Maybe not this Absolutely. year. But, uh, Absolutely. Maybe I'll swim yeah. re- swim down to you, actually. <laughs> yeah, read that book. And then you'll be like... To the halfway, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Top man. Right, right. Yeah, Cheers, Mehmet. So See much. you soon. Cheers, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, mate.